Governor Udomi Manuel says electoral bill passage is key to unlocking Nigeria's potentials, while constitution review is a distraction. And in response to an interview done by President Buhari, Afeni Fere calls the nation's leader an unrepentant tribalist. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anapo. Governor Udo Emanuel of Akwaibom has spoken on the passage of the electoral bill, saying it is fundamental to the furtherance of Nigeria's democracy. He said that taking the nation on the path of constitutional review would present a distraction as the issue of the electoral bill, which should assure Nigerians of their stake in democracy, is on ground. He added that though the electoral bill may not be a single solution to all of Nigeria's problems, it is a major step forward. Well, joining us to have this conversation is Professor Richard Wokocha. He is a professor at the Department of Public Law, River State University. And of course, joining us is a political analyst at Demola at Dewale. Thank you very much for joining us. It's my pleasure. All right. I'm going to start it's with. My pleasure. I'll start with you, Professor. Um, the interesting thing about what the governor of Akwaibom State is emphasizing on is the fact that we should, as a country, including our, our lawmakers, be focusing on the issue of the electoral bill, making sure that it goes through the process and the different stages and get passed uh, because he feels that this is a step in the right direction and it will help address most of the problems that we're facing as a country. Where do you stand on this? I think having an electoral reform can you hear me now? Yes. Having an, electoral, having an electoral reform or concluding the electoral reform is a very good thing, uh, but it's not even nearly the fourth best thing to having our constitution uh, reviewed. Um, having the right, the right position in our constitution will solve a lot more problems. Uh, than completing the uh, review process. That's not to say that review process, the uh, electoral review process, electoral reform process is not necessary. It's a good thing, but it's not at all comparable uh, to being able to make fundamental changes in our constitution now, uh, which the review presents. So which should take precedence? Because he's arguing side by side, saying that we're paying too much attention to the constitutional review and we're letting the electoral bill lie there and gather dust. So are you saying that both should be taken into consideration side by side, or one should take precedence over the other? Because you're saying that the Constitution is very if important. Me, the Constitution is most important of all. Um, the reason is simple. You can only hold an election, and a successful and democratic election in, in a good society are uh, a good political society. And that society is designed by the constitution. So even if you have a very good election in a society or a country like ours that is fundamentally flawed, um, we can find so many ways in which we can show that the, the system, the um, structure of our country is fundamentally flawed. The bulk of our money goes to the center, which is supposed to be a place for administration. And where the money should go, which is the country where we need to develop, receives the least. Now, if you have a, ref a review of our constitution that enables us to get back to a proper federation that we should be, you can hold election without rancor. And when we hear what is happening in any region or any state or uh, at the center, it won't be as important as it is now. So getting the society right, getting the constitutional structure right is key. It's only within that frame that you will hold an election. So the election cannot be, uh, electoral reform, which is quite important, cannot be more important than reviewing the constitution and getting the country properly structured. Let me come to you, Mr. Justice. Um, do you hold the same um, position as the professor? Because the issue of the electoral bill has 
you know, it was more on the lips of every person uh, before the 2019 elections and right after. We remember the back and forth between the executive, in fact, the presidents and the legislature, where they were, you know, there was pressure on the president to sign it. Um, and then they were about to go on some recess, hoping that, you know, the president would do it. But then the president didn't. And now the Ninth Assembly has started the process from scratch and it's still go ongoing. Um, one, one would wonder why it's taking so long because, I mean, we, we would be hoping that this electoral bill would have been signed into law before the 2023 elections. But do you think that it's a priority? And maybe if, if it isn't, that's why the National Assembly is not paying attention to it. Unfortunately, I think that we uh, have lost uh, Demola Justice. But let me go back to Professor um, Wakocha. Let's look at some of the interesting uh, things in the bill. Um, I remember I, I, I've spoken with um, INEC officials over and over, and they keep talking about the issue of e-voting and some other things that need to be in, infused into that electoral bill that are not there. Um, e-voting is a thing that we have also bandied. We've seen politicians throw it here and there. Even us, the average voters, were pointing to it as something that we need and that might help the electoral process. But in reality, is it something that really can work in the Nigerian setting? Yes, um, if a thing can work in the Nigerian setting, um, it's, it's, not so, it's not so mundane, it's not uh, so much of a rocket science. Um, we have transited from banking in the banking hall to throwing our money any time of the day we want through the machines. It's not very different. In fact, even the voting, the ATM machines can be configured to be used for voting. With your card, you can go to the ATM machine if it is configured for that purpose and call up what you want to do, which is the uh, voting exercise and particular election you want, cast your vote and enter the same way you do to draw your money or to do a transfer. So it's not strange. Besides, a big organization like the Nigerian Bar Association, yes, nothing compared. Professor, are you still there? To the population of Nigeria, but we've seen it used by organizations within Nigeria. Past three elections. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I was saying the Nigerian Bar Association, for instance, has used it in the last three elections, and they were able to uh, uh, conclude their elections. Yes, there were questions, but those questions are nothing to be compared to the normal questions that arise from the Nigerian electoral process. And the beautiful thing again about the problem that electoral, uh, election, uh, electronic voting presents is that whatever my practices that are done are usually left here. It's, it's difficult to get them off the system. So even in the uh, electoral appeals, um, electoral contestation petitions and appeals, those things can be pointed out and decisions can easily be reached. So it's not rocket science. It's what is going on around the world. It's being done in this country by different organizations that have conducted elections electronically. And I dare say that if whatever political reform we are doing does not lead to electronic voting, then I think we are just wasting our time. I, I just want again to plug in here when we talk about you know it being realistic, the Nigerian Bar Association, with, with due respect, it's just a handful of people compared to the 200 agree. plus million. I agree, some, ten, some, ten, some uh, tens of thousands of people are there, about hundreds. Compared uh, to the 200 plus million, million people that people. we have in the country. So really, uh, the reality again, the reason why I wanted to chime in here is because um, every single time we want to register a SIM card, we do a biometrics all over again. We have a lot of data in this country. <laughs> As it is, we have done the NIN. Uh, as, as I speak now, um, certain people still do not have the card in itself. We still have a piece of paper. Um, yes. We still do biometrics if we want to get an ATM card from a bank. You want to do your driver's license, you do a brand new. 
So we have so much data scattered about. If we have not been able to put all of that data in one place, you want, I, want, I recently went to get my international passport. I still had to do a brand new biometrics. So um, when we say that, oh, it's not rocket science, we do make it seem like rocket science in this country because we've not been able to harmonize all of that data that we have. Same for our identity cards. So how do we do um, that regularize that process of e-voting if we've not been able to regularize the normal ID card with all of the data that we have, you know, linked to one, one card. How are we going to make that happen for our cards when we're voting? Harmonizing our data into a single data bank is extremely important. Uh, there is no doubt about that. But that is not a key requirement for the voting. Every voter is a registered voter. And our biometrics have been captured by INEC. So it's, it's not like you're starting afresh. INEC has a biometric. Right now, we are using electronics for verification before voting. So the data is already there. For those who are going to register newly, they will get their number, and they will be able to do the same. For that particular purpose, which is election, we are already halfway there because right now, as we speak, INEC has used electronic uh, process for verification before going into voting in the last uh, one or two elections that we have held. So it's not as if we are going to start afresh, uh, try to capture everybody's uh, uh, biometrics uh, data again, and the rest. Uh, we already have it in INEC, uh, with INEC. Okay, let me move to Mr. Justice. I think we've have him, we have him back. Uh, let's take a closer look at Governor Dom Emanuel's um, statement um, about this whole issue of uh, the electoral bill. He, he made a statement saying that um, taking the nation on the path of constitutional amendments is a distraction from the main issues. Um, Ademola Justice, you know that Nigeria is facing a potpourri of issues from the north to the south to the east uh, down to the west. Um, do you somewhat agree with the governor of Akwaibom State when he says that this constitutional amendment is a distraction from the main issues of Nigeria? Or could that be the solution to some of the problems that we're facing as a country? Thank you very much. You know, I would just want to apply the same route with my colleague who has said one or two things about the necessity of constitutional amendments. And at the same time, I will want to say, as a governor is the chief executive officer of the state, and relatively, it will have a that which is at the same time, I want everybody to know that the necessity for an amendment of our constitution cannot be underplayed. And going by the fact that the age of the constitution and the emerging issues in the nation, going by the expectations of almost every stakeholder in the Nigeria project, the need to review the constitution. I give it to the governor, but I maybe not on, you know, in the practice of law, it is expected that you get you to hear from all parties before you can agree or before you can pass a judgment. But like I said, I'll give it to him on one side, but on the other side, it is a long due necessity to review our constitution. Let's talk about this, the problems that Nigeria is facing right now. It's not news for, except you leave on Mars, even the people that are outside Nigeria, I, I hear them talking about the situation in Nigeria. Um, yes, the constitutional review, according to you and the professor, is a way forward uh, and is some form of a solution to some of Nigeria's problems. But is that the only thing we need to consider now? Because we see that our problems are multifaceted. Fixing a constitution, Will that douse all the tension and all the agitations that we're facing? No, like we have already been saying, Nigeria has numerous issues, numerous problems. So we don't have a monolithic answer to all the problems. The reconstitution, like I said, as a democratic necessity would only pave way to, it's just like we say in economics, it's a means to the end not an end in itself. It would only guide and assist the process of rebutting a nation. It will not solve the entirety of the problems. It will only lead us to solving the patterns to the constitution. Just like uh, the other speaker said, you see, the constitutionality of the nation 
plays a critical role in our advanced people to a large extent and observed that we need to go back to the drawing room and reorganize how our organization was fused up in issue. So to review the concern now is as urgent as possible. But at the same time, I want to give it to every other issue that consolidated solution will help us as a nation. But constitution is one because the review of the constitution will take us to the respective concepts of the project called Nigeria. Constitution dictates how we live as a nation. It tells how this is it like the Niger Deltans or the Southerners would have been assuaging over the years. The issue of how oil wells are assigned, particularly to I think we lost Mr. Justice there. Uh, let's move on to back to Professor uh, Wakocha. Uh, he made mention, the governor of Akwaibum State, Trudomi Mano, made mention of the fact that our democracy is a borrowed system of government. And he said, I'd like to quote him directly, uh, that with the level of success so far, it has become expedient to streamline the system. So the question is, how do we streamline this system? Because a lot of people have complained about the way that we run our democracy. I can never forget what uh, a, a, a presidential aide under the Good Luck Jonathan administration, uh, Dr. Doyo Kupe, said when he was asked about how we run the democracy in Nigeria. And he said that, 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 that there is a Nigerian way of doing things. In other words, uh, our democracy was run the Nigerian way. But really, how do you streamline um, a government, uh, a system of government such as this? Many have said that we really aren't running a democracy in this country. And most people have said that nations need to embrace a democracy. But is it really something that would work for Nigeria? Because I've, I'm one of those people who believe that there are countries who run very well, but they do not run a democracy. So does Nigeria really need a democracy to stand it on its two feet? Yes, Nigeria does need a democracy. Um, the truth we are running away from is the fact that our problem is not so much the Nigerian way of running democracy, but an attempt to operate democracy in Nigeria. <clears throat> now, what is Nigerian about Nigeria? It is a fact that in 1966, a fledgling federal nation was suddenly bash into a unitary system, a unitary command system. Now, everything changed in our life as a country from 1966 when that happened. Why that is still there, it will be difficult to run a democratic government. It will be difficult to do a whole lot of things that you should be able to do in a country. But the main reason why you are having that difficulty is the constitutional problem. The fact that as a federation, the federating units do not have the powers that are due federating units of a federation. Federating units cannot plan their lives. Federating units cannot generate income and plan their development according to their pace and according to their desire. Everybody is locked down to whatever is decided at the center. At the end of the day, funds are handed out every month uh, to the units from the center instead of the reverse, which is what happens in federation. And first, Excuse me, in the First Republic, we, we generated our resources at the units and paid 50% tax to the center with which the national interest was run and national assignment and responsibilities were run. Back to today, I mean, move forward to 2021, you are in a situation where everybody goes with a plate in hand to ask a jack every month for some handout from the center which they will come here and share among themselves because the bulk of the money is going to the center. And because the center really ought not to have any serious business to do, they have to ply it into, ply it into paying huge salaries for themselves. We are uh, National Assembly members and federal executive officers. We earn what is fraudulent as far as the Nigerian uh, any system is concerned. So if you have that system and you don't fix it, there is nothing you are going to do to effectively run a democracy. Okay. A democracy where your money is not going to where your mouth is. I, I, it will not work. I want to quickly put, put in a question, uh, Professor. 
I, the question I was asking was not necessarily about the... I know that we can, of course, run a democracy in this country, but I'm talking about the persons that we have in government. Is it in, in it, in the average Nigerian politician, to follow the tenets and the rules of dem a democratic system? Can they follow the rules and regulations? Because it's easy for us to bandy the word democracy around, but in the real sense of it, can we allow the freedoms of democracy in the country we call Nigeria? They can, but again, you need to know that systems are not desired for people to do what they like. Their responsibilities are duties. That is why you have a constitution, that's why you have laws governing everything in the nation. So we are not supposed to be asking ourselves, can the people do it? Whenever that question is asked, it means that our system has failed and we are unable to punish those who are abusing the, the system or abusing the law. So we are asking that question because we have an absurd situation, which ought not to be. People are compelled to do what they love. Okay, I think we're having a little connection issue, but I think uh, Justice is back before we wrap up this segment. Let me go back to you, Mr. Adewale. Um, the governor of Akwaibom State also talked about the um, what we should be prioritizing now in the life of Nigeria, being that we're facing insecurity, um, the economy is taking a dip, um, the the dollar is taking is having or the naira is having a free fall. Um, you know, infrastructure. The government, would, this federal government, will tell you that they're building a lot of infrastructure. Yes, but then insecurity is raising its ugly head yet again, and and it's more than a year that this has been going on. So he talked about all of these things. And he talked about the fact that we're not really ready to look at the major issues that Nigeria has. He made mention of the fact that we do not have pipelines that pump products to every part of the country. He also said, he asked the question more like, how many roads, which roads are we having these trucks that would take these petroleum products through that, you know, he was talking about the fact that we keep earmarking monies for infrastructural developments, but we hardly see those infrastructural developments. And he's saying that we may not really grow as a country if we're not prioritizing certain things in this country. Now, I ask you, I'm throwing back that question to you. Where should the government start to prioritize? What, what do you think? If you were put on the table with, let's say, for example, the president, and you were asked your opinion as to what we should, where we should start to deal with Nigeria's problems. What would that be? Uh, Mr. Damola, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, your internet is um, giving us a little bit of problems. Uh, so I'm going to go back to Professor Wokocha. Hopefully he's back. Um, Professor, so I throw that question to you. Where do we start to prioritize Nigeria's problems? What, what do we pick? Because, of course, you can't deal with everything at the same time. Yes, the president's plate is full, but what should he do right now? If I have to advise the president, I would say he needs to change his perspective. Uh, a few days ago, I know the most critical problem we are facing in the country now is insecurity, and it's, it's, it's creeping up everywhere. I mean, it's coming up in every region of the country. And I think the solution lies in the president changing his perspective. A few days ago, I listened to the president talking about insecurity, and he says, on one hand, herdsmen who are causing havoc in the country are non-nationals. They are foreigners. On the other hand, you don't want to deal with them as criminals. And when states take steps to prevent them from causing havoc in their regions, you say that is unconstitutional or that is illegal and that is wrong. They just can't do that. So if we are facing foreigners who are killing us in the various parts of the country, and you say, no, we shouldn't do anything to defend ourselves, then what exactly are you calling for? So I think the president needs to change his perspective on that burning issue, because around that issue revolves a lot of other issues. And if we don't fix it, I wonder if we can even have an election, in if, we, if we can have a country in which to have an election in 2023. So I will advise the president first to change his perspective in dealing with the most fundamental issue now, which is insecurity, and oh. treat crime as crime. A non-national shouldn't come into Nigeria without papers. And if he comes in, he, he should work according to Nigerian rules. Until we fix that, I am afraid we are running into a deeper problem in this country. 
Adama Justice is back with us on the phone this time. Uh, hopefully we can hear him. Mr. Justice, I'm, I'm still going to throw that question to you, but this time I'm going to you know, take from what the professor has said. He's saying that we cannot allow outsiders to come and cause confusion in our country. Um, they have to abide by the rules and regulations. Um, if a person comes from outside, outside of town and realizes that this place, you know, you can cut corners and you can do as you like uh, and nobody's held accountable, what would stop them from doing what they're doing. Now, the presidency is not the first, this is not the first time that they're saying that the people who are supposedly causing all of the insecurity are outsiders. Um, but it does not seem like we are treating them the way we should. Um, because let's take, for example, Nigerians were in Ghana causing a mayhem. Would they be, would we really, would they be having this conversation on their TV stations saying, oh, Nigerians are in, responsible for banditry, uh, but we would, not, we would not deal with them with the full weight of the law? Should that even be a conversation we should be having at this point? I think we lost him again. Unfortunately, his connection is really bad. Uh, we're hoping that on the phone we will be able to have him. Uh, but finally, Professor, before I let you go, um, the governor of Akwaibom State had said that the PDP is what Nigeria needs for uh, it to be brought back to its brighter place. I'd like to quote him directly. He said, Nigerians need the PDP to step up. He also said, Nigerians need the PDP to save the country. What's the difference between the PDP and the APC, apart from the acronyms, uh, in terms of ideology and what they have to offer us? Is it about the parties? Is it about the people? What exactly is it? I was going to ask not just the ideology, but also in terms of the personalities. Are they not the same people who have been moving from one party to the other? I do not think that our problem lies with political parties. Political parties will not solve our problem. Our problems are more fundamental than political parties, and we have discussed some of them, we have highlighted some of them in this interview. We need something fundamental that changes the structure on which these things are possible. And it does not lie in the hands or mouth of any political party uh, to solve that problem. We must face it as a nation and make those structural changes. When those structural changes are made, you will see the difference. In the First Republic, did you hear of one group fighting the other group or complaining about marginalization and all that? No. Fix the country, get us back to a proper federation, and we will all be too busy producing and making wealth and developing ourselves. We will be too busy doing that to remember where which person comes from. All right. So I think uh, PDP and the APC are not our, our problem. They don't have the key to our, our to solution to our challenges. All right. Well, Professor Richard Wakacha is of the Department of Public Law, River State University. Thank you so much for being part of the conversation. Uh, Dewale uh, uh, Justice is a public you. affairs analyst. Unfortunately, his internet connection was really bad. Thank you all for being part of the conversation. Well, we'll take a short break. And when we return, Afeni Ferrer tells us what they think about the president's recent interview. Stay with us. We'll be right back.